This is a documentary, an oral history of U.S. strategic nuclear policy. Those who played a part tell the story. They summarize the evolution of a 60-year history, from the dawn of nuclear weapons to the 21st century. The speakers address two fundamental questions. First, what has been the purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons? And second, how have the policy, the weapons, and the war plans evolved? Foremost, this is a history of nuclear deterrence. The deterrent role of nuclear weapons has remained constant throughout the evolution of policy, world events, war plans, and nuclear delivery systems. This is not a comprehensive history, but rather a primer to stimulate further thought about strategic nuclear policy and about the broader question of national security strategy. There are significant aspects not covered in this series. The role of the legislative branch, the development of non-strategic nuclear forces, specific weapons technologies, and the role of the nuclear laboratories and the production complex. These are stories for another time. History tells us where we've been, and it can provide us some valuable insight for the future. This oral history is intended to provide a foundation for discussing some very important questions. What truly will be the role of nuclear weapons? What will be the requirements in the future for U.S. nuclear forces, for the stockpile, and for the nuclear weapons complex? The bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force invaded Marienburg today. Two flying fortresses were shot down. Another German factory is missing. When the U.S. Army 8th Air Force arrived in Britain in 1942, a doctrine of daylight high-altitude precision bombing developed around the Norden bomb site. When we thought that we were going to be able to hit military targets and never hit civilian targets, we thought we could hit a pickle barrel from 18,000 feet. The British said, you can't do that because you're never that accurate, and if you fly by daylight, you'll lose too many planes to German interceptors. So they bomb by night, aiming at entire cities. It was an Allied bomber offensive with both the British and the Americans adapting different doctrines and bombing in different ways. Uh, it was much shorter distances that the bombers had to fly, and it was against a different set of defenses than you had in the Pacific. The air war in the Pacific was more catch-as-catch-can in the way we had to adapt to it. Japan was understood as a, as a special case. The Air Force was willing to do area bombing when it couldn't do what they were counting as precision bombing which also wasn't that precise, but uh, it, it was a different uh, operational setup and it was a different way of understanding what they were doing. The basic question was whether or not you would be able to break industrial structures, aircraft production plants, engine production plants, petroleum refineries, uh, electrical grids, things like that, whether you'd be able to destroy those with your bombing campaign. In Germany, factories were highly concentrated and often segregated from residential areas, making them targetable by precision bombing. While in Japan, war industries were dispersed rather than concentrated, and they were often intertwined with densely populated residential districts. The Japanese target complex prompted the operational commander, General Curtis LeMay, to change tactics. When LeMay decided to take the B-29s, which were really very elegant bombers and uh, had lots of equipment, he took a lot of the equipment out so they could fly with more bombs, more incendiary bombs, and sent them over by night in a night attack rather than by daylight so they wouldn't run into any Japanese interceptors. LeMay was the most effective combat commander of any service that I met in the three years I was in the Air Force. He had one objective, that was to destroy targets, and associated with that, the objective of reducing the number of crew members lost per unit of target destruction. If you see LeMay in Europe, and if you see LeMay in the Pacific, Tommy Power's always there. It is my own belief that Tommy Power was probably more the strategist than LeMay. But I think that those two men worked very well together in terms of getting the most out of their equipment and their men. 
tried out this approach very similar to the British in Europe of just bombing out all of Tokyo in one attack. Maybe if you burn an entire city, which uh, in the case of Tokyo involved 100,000 people being killed, uh, the Japanese will quit. The first and the fiercest of these urban area attacks came on March 9, 1945. LeMay had abandoned the doctrine of high-altitude daylight bombing against military assets and reverted to the urban area firebombing strategy practiced by the British against Germany. A half a world away from the carnage in the high desert of New Mexico, Scientists from Los Alamos made preparations to test a new and more lethal device, an atomic bomb. The foundation of strategic nuclear policy would arise from a confluence of this revolutionary new capability and the air war strategy practiced over Japan. In July 1945, the U.S. was facing a costly invasion of the Japanese mainland. Hospitals were being set up. There was one 20,000-bed hospital on Tinian, where I was stationed alone. We could look across and see 1,600 ships in the harbor at Saipan, preparing for the invasion. As American planners prepared to maximize direct military pressure upon the Japanese government and the population, President Truman issued his final approval to the Secretary of War for the release of the atomic bomb. The atomic bombings were the culmination of the great firebombing of Tokyo, a strategy that copiously provided that military pressure. It was such a shock to the Japanese to see 80 to 100,000 people killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the most brutal way that, uh, that they reacted to it uh, more than they did, I think, to the, to the firebombing. Although the extent of the firebombing is not well recognized, uh, and I have never seen an analysis of whether the nuclear could have been avoided if LeMay had been allowed another few weeks to carry on the firebombing, as at one point he I think was suggesting. When I went to Tokyo, it was uh, just absolutely devastated. The damage in Tokyo was a result of thousands of raids, thousands of sorties by thousands of bombers. Whereas in the case of, of the atomic bomb, uh, there was one airplane and one bomb, and people were totally unprepared for what happened. Whereas the dropping of the second bomb, even though the extent of the damage in Nagasaki was less than Hiroshima, the fact that there was a second bomb and the, and the implication was that there were more, uh, I think that's, that's what finally tipped the scales. The Japanese didn't surrender in two days after Nagasaki because their military capability had been reduced very much. Uh, they surrendered because uh, they had the vision that this could go happen every week and and they couldn't stand to have all those cities destroyed. And in nuclear deterrence, if civilians get killed, we can call that incidental damage or collateral damage. But many people said that's what really is the basis of deterrence, uh, that the other side can't stand having that many people killed. Hiroshima and Nagasaki ushered in the need to think differently about war with atomic weapons. Would the U.S. adopt a de facto policy of urban area atomic bombardment? Were the cities of an adversary to be held hostage as a deterrent to aggression? How would the targeting of urban industrial areas be reconciled with the tradition of precision bombing? And as the accuracy of nuclear weapon systems improved, would more precise targeting introduce new concerns about the prospect of nuclear war fighting 
These questions, and many others, would inform the evolution of a strategic nuclear policy. Over time, policy would be derived from the influence of successive presidential administrations, dynamic world events, as well as the evolutionary development of nuclear weapon systems. The mobilization in the conventional weapons field and nuclear field are very parallel. In both cases, civilian needs trumped any military need. The one big difference is we kept secret what was happening in the nuclear labs. Like most Americans in 1945, the scientists and their families at Los Alamos were anxious to put the war behind them. Many returned to universities, leaving behind a scientific enterprise that faced an uncertain future and a new body of knowledge which continued to be shrouded in great secrecy. Uh, there were very few people who actually understood the atomic bombs as they existed in the period right after World War II. Uh, the security restrictions were still intense. Uh, the development of atomic bombs, nuclear bombs, was still in an early phase. Everyone understood, kind of outside of their official capacity, that the atomic bomb was a, a weapon of extraordinary devastation. So they, they had this, this uh, tool, this weapon, on the one hand, and the knowledge that they were, uh, the knowledge base that they were building was for much more discriminate force. On the other hand, there had to be assumptions that would be made that would guide military planning. Would you or wouldn't you use the atomic bomb? A commander's job is to demonstrate how to uh, prevail in a war and therefore how to plan for that war. And as such, nuclear weapons pretty much from the beginning have been treated as uh, instruments of war. These weapons were simply looked upon as being essentially larger conventional weapons. Uh, I think that Truman in particular had a, a very personal understanding of the damage that these weapons could do, and I believe that Truman really didn't want to use them. Private reflections were quite apprehensive about what the implications of this were for the future of humanity. In terms of his public pronouncements, uh, he, of course, associated the bomb with uh, victory in World War II. And, and also, for a brief time period at least, Truman and the Truman administration uh, seemed to seriously explore possibilities of uh, international control. If they do not now accept our term, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Even as President Truman issued a final ultimatum before the second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, he promised to redirect atomic power towards the maintenance of world peace. The stage was set for the development of a proposal for the international control of atomic energy by an expert board of consultants that included Robert Oppenheimer, who had led the development of the atomic bomb. In less than a year, Bernard Baruch, a successful Wall Street speculator, was appointed as the U.S. representative to the U.N. Atomic Energy Commission. There, he presented the American proposal, which came to be known as the Baruch Plan. Almost immediately, the Soviet delegation raised objections to the plan's proposed controls on fissionable materials and an on-site inspection regime that threatened ongoing secret work deep inside Russia. The Soviet position was that, you know, we, we're going to expect another world war in, say, 20 years, so we need to start preparing for it now. At the e end of the war, the Soviet leaders made a, a number of speeches setting out their view of, you know, how international relations would develop after the war. And uh, Stalin said that um, Lenin's theory of imperialism was still operative, and that as long as imperialism existed, there would be wars. When George Kennan, the American charge in Moscow, reported on Stalin's speech, official Washington first began to regard the Soviets as a threat. <laughs> 
Cannon's long telegram was meant to do several things. One, to alert Americans that uh, Russia was not going to be easy to live with. Secondly, if we wait and wait and hold them, uh, in the long run, communism might lose its expansionist self-confidence. Now, Cannon's containment doctrine said that if you keep the Russians contained, keep them from expanding, uh, they will look at their own uh, article of uh, scientific analysis that says uh, the world is bound to have come under communist control and see that it's wrong. But throughout 1946, the Soviets consolidated political power in a series of buffer states, forming what Winston Churchill would call an Iron Curtain. With the onset of the Cold War symbolized by Churchill's speech, increasingly the emphasis was on maintaining nuclear supremacy, uh, preparing America and the West militarily for this long and desperate struggle. Churchill's suspicion of Joseph Stalin at the end of World War II had been confirmed, and he cautioned Truman to protect and maintain the American monopoly of the atomic bomb. The fact that that came more or less simultaneously with the other effort to promote international control, uh, I think shows the ambivalence of that period. As he contemplated the possibility of an emerging Soviet nuclear capability, Truman was also determined to maintain civilian control of the bomb and appointed David Lilienthal chairman of the newly created Atomic Energy Commission. In April 1947, its first report warned of serious weaknesses in the situation from the standpoint of the national defense and security. One thing we really don't know today is how much did the Soviets know about how few functional atomic bombs we had in 1946 and 47. And by many measures, we had none. What we had was on a shelf in a state that would take weeks to get it ready for use. These were, would have been very manpower-intensive nuclear weapons that had to be kept ready. And we weren't doing that uh, because uh, there wasn't the motivation to do it and uh, we weren't expecting the Cold War, weren't expecting to use weapons against the Soviet Union. In 1947, the Truman Doctrine, ensuring the independence of Greece and Turkey, drew a line preventing further Soviet expansion in Europe. So the foreign policy of the United States is the creation of conditions in which we and other nations will be able to work out a way of life free from coercion. You have to remember that the United States was doing something that was revolutionary through World War II and immediately beyond. We were making decisions that we would enter and remain engaged in the world in a way that we had never done before. And the United States had loaned Europe about $11 billion in various aid programs to kind of kickstart uh, the French British economies and in late 46 early 47 economic progress begins to slow and so there's this growing sense of emergency In 1948, the collapse of Czechoslovakia to communist rule shook us up in that uh, Czechoslovakia had been the only democracy in Eastern Europe uh, between the wars, and uh, it seemed like this was the last uh, kind of straw. But I think it's the Berlin crisis that really begins to give this a kind of military edge. But when Stalin imposed the blockade, I mean, he was resisting what he saw as moves to create a separate West Germany. The blockade on Berlin shook us up more. Uh, it's the second blow within a short period of time in 1948, and it directly involved American forces. It seemed to be an attempt maybe to set dominoes going to affect all of Germany. We mainly bet on a non-military approach. We were using military transports to fly coal and food to West Berlin. But as a backup for that, we also did make a big move of American bombers to Britain. I think it's fair to say that the contingency planning by 46 and 47 was focused on the fear that you may have a war with the Soviet Union. 
we warned the Soviets that if they did some things they could easily do, shoot down our airline, our planes, or send tanks into Berlin, that we were moving, allegedly, the nuclear uh, forces into Britain. Uh, I think sending the B-29s to Europe was a kind of reminder that the U.S. had the atomic bomb, but, but Stalin knew that. He didn't need to be reminded. To stop the airlift, he'd have had to escalate the situation. I think that's what he didn't want to do. He knew there were limits to the confrontation. Just the mere existence of atomic bombs in 1948, I think, helped restrain him. The American uh, hints at using nuclear weapons in 1948 shows that when you have a monopoly, you can lightly play with nuclear threats and get some results. With the prospect of conflict on the horizon in Western Europe, it had become clear to the Truman administration that there was now a critical need for some fundamental policy guidance about the use of atomic weapons. The Berlin crisis of 1948 was the first of several critical drivers of U.S. strategic nuclear policy. As they prepared contingency war plans, the Joint Chiefs of Staff sought guidance on the use of atomic weapons. I don't think there's really any defined, clearly defined U.S. policy toward uh, whether nuclear weapons will be used and, and how they might be used before the autumn of 1948. And that is what makes NSC 30 and the NSC 20 series so important, is be they begin to come to grips with some of those issues. NSC 30 declared that the U.S. was prepared to use atomic weapons in the event of war, and the decision to do so would rest with the president. The president will decide to use them when he wants to. He'd hate to use them ever, ever again, but if it's necessary, he will. NSC-30 first established a deterrent role for atomic weapons as a counterbalance to Soviet forces in Eastern Europe. The National Security Council also developed NSC-20-4. But what we now had is we're settling down into the rhythm of the Cold War, as we're now settling down into the Soviet Union as the enemy, as we're now settling down into the United States strategy for deterring the Soviet Union, if deterrence fails, having to fight a war with the Soviet Union, being based around nuclear weapons, we're settling down into that rhythm where there's a process that guidance flows into the planning system, and that guidance is going to come out of the National Security Council mechanism. Uh, both Hoyt Vandenberg, who was chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, and the Joint Chiefs themselves are beginning to ask the question, if we had to execute the contingency war plans that we have tomorrow, what would happen? Uh, teams were sent out to look at the readiness of Strategic Air Command. They came back with uh, very negative reports. So Vandenberg looked around. The senior war, World War II leadership has sort of gone. The Akers, the Spotses, and LeMay's head and shoulders above everybody else. So he gets the call. LeMay was a, a brilliant operator, and I think a, probably fair to say a brilliant commander. Very dynamic. Uh, very energetic, uh, and uh, he wanted a force that could, in fact, fight a nuclear war. LeMay uh, was continually concerned about the lack of photographic intelligence. They began the atomic targeting uh, based on uh, maps, and some captured German reconnaissance photographs. So they took the analytical inputs and they sat down and said, you know, the weapon will go here, it will go here, here's how we're going to get there. And that you would also employ the same ideas that had been used during World War II for deep interdiction strategic bombing, and that is to take out the enemy's industrial capacity. Now, of course, industrial capacity was also co-located with cities, and so there you would have a tremendous amount of disruption using nuclear weapons on those targets. LeMay's primary objective was to ensure that SAC would have the capability to deliver a single massive attack, and for this, he would require a force of new long-range bombers. Harry Truman came to office without a lot of experience, certainly no experience in foreign affairs to speak of. The one thing that he brought to the White House was a very 
fine-tuned look at how you did budget making. And he insisted that Forrestal stick within very, very tight constraints. James Forrestal became the nation's first Secretary of Defense in the midst of a brutal budget battle among the newly formed Joint Chiefs. Forrestal tried but failed to resolve the differences. In February 1949, Eisenhower was brought in to mediate the dispute over budget priorities that favored the Air Force's new B-36 atomic bomber. The Navy saw this as a threat to its ability to project power from aircraft carriers in the they saw the Air Force uh, perhaps uh, as uh, threatening the control of, of Navy, sea-based aviation. The Navy is, is, is um, posing some very serious questions about American nuclear strategy and reliance on strategic bombing. Uh, and that, to me, is kind of the more important dimension to the Admiral's Revolt. Because what they're saying, is, in a sense, is what some people in the Air Force itself had admitted. General Harmon did, a, did an analysis of the strategic bombing campaign and concluded that it'll do serious harm, serious damage to the Soviet Union, but it's not an assured war-winning strategy. Soon, decisions would be made by Forrestal's successor, Lewis Johnson, ensuring that SAC would get its atomic bombers. In early summer 1949, they represented the only U.S. strategic capability to deter the Soviets. In July, the Senate would ratify the NATO Treaty, and now atomic weapons would underpin Article 5 of this new security commitment. One month later, an event unfolding deep inside the Soviet Union would seriously challenge this deterrent capability. On September 3, 1949, a specially equipped B-29, flying east of the Kamchatka Peninsula, detected the presence of radioactive residue from the blast of Joe 1, the first Soviet atomic test. Only months before, the AEC had deployed a system for the sampling and analysis of evidence from an above-ground nuclear detonation. Some of us were not surprised. Some of us thought that uh, they would be right on our heels, so to speak, and clearly they were. There were other people, primarily in the government, that thought that it would take them a long, much longer time. There were a couple of important people who said it would take a long time, General Groves and Van, Van Ever Bush, but even Van Ever Bush said it'll take 20 years unless they give it the highest priority, which is exactly what they did. So we underestimated the speed with which they could move. We fail to understand the degree of assistance in 1948-49 that the Soviets had obtained from spies in the West. The detection of the test immediately put in train a number of actions by the president. In the next month, for example, he approved a request by the JCS to uh, very largely increase the capability for producing nuclear materials. The approval of the Special Advisory Committee's recommendations set in motion a series of events. Increased production of fissile material at the Plutonium Processing Facility in Hanford, Washington, accelerated production of the new Mark IV bomb at Los Alamos, and construction of nuclear weapons storage facilities around the country. And then they increased everything. They not only increased the production of U-235 and plutonium, they began a vigorous uh, exploration of the Colorado Plateau to find more uranium. I think they were making it up as they went along. We were all making it up as we went along. Uh, the executive branch on the one hand and the legislative on another. There's no, no question. I mean, it was a very revolutionary time. This is, this, we were dealing with something that nobody had ever had before. The Soviet possession of the atomic bomb ended the United States' nuclear monopoly. This would profoundly affect defense policy and war planning. The military strategy depended uh, completely on the capacity for our monopoly of the nuclear weapons to 
uh, deter and uh, counterbalance the very large conventional forces which the Soviet Union had. As early as August 1947, the Joint War Plans Committee began drafting a series of contingency war plans that authorized an ever-increasing role for atomic weapons. Half Moon was the first of these plans approved during the Berlin Crisis of 1948. There's a, you know, a witch's brew of names that you have from those days as you move from Half Moon to Trojan to Off Tackle to what have you, and then all the supporting war plans, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, you have a joint outline war plan and you have supporting plans for it. And the jo joint outline war plan that the JCS approved will take whatever the strategic concept is and put it into play. In the absence of, of uh, detailed higher level uh, guidance, um, those involved in nuclear war planning uh, carried over what they knew from World War II, uh, including a sense that they were involved in an enterprise of precision uh, targeting, they carried over the, the same sense of target categories, they carried over the same sense that uh, nuclear weapons were primarily blast weapons. A nuclear weapon has, in addition, radiation, fire, which are difficult to predict. They're difficult to calculate. The planning of nuclear weapons uh, tends not to include these effects simply because they are so difficult to calculate, but they're there. The earliest weapons, of course, were uranium bombs, fission bombs. These were delivered by high-altitude, long-range bombers. Uh, but the accuracies of these early systems were measured in terms of uh, large fractions of a nautical mile or maybe even a couple of nautical miles. So the, the suitable targets had to be large, large area targets. In late 1949, a new emergency war plan dubbed Off Tackle called for attacks on 104 urban targets with 220 atomic bombs, plus a re-attack reserve of 72 weapons. The prime targeting objective was to disrupt the Soviet will to wage war. The targeting categories were completely consistent with, with targeting philosophy and some operations in World War II. The first one was BRAVO, which stood for blunting of nuclear forces and nuclear capability. The second one was DELTA, which stood for destruction of the urban industrial base. And the third one was Romeo, which stood for retarding an enemy's ability to mobilize. This was our short-term war plan. And within the next 18 months, there was nothing other than the air offensive, and within the air offensive, specifically the nuclear component of it, which carried any chance of affecting the outcome of the war early on. What impact would this have on the defense of Western Europe? Would the president be more cautious in the face of Soviet provocation? By the end of 1949, Truman was forced to re-examine national security policy in light of a nuclear-armed adversary. With the explosion of the first Soviet atomic bomb, the United States felt vulnerable really for the first time. How much is enough for deterrence? Herb York in his book says that Logically, it would have been enough to have fission weapons, and I believe that. But politically, it is not enough, especially when you say the other side, because we can think of a super weapon, they might think of a super weapon and build it. The primary reason for the development of the super, for, for in, ultimately instituting a fairly aggressive program to develop the super, was fear of the Russians. People who a year or so before had been committed to the idea of international control uh, of atomic weapons, now have made a dramatic shift toward the idea of keeping ahead uh, of, the, of the Russians. Knowledge of the super, as the hydrogen or thermonuclear bomb was first known, was closely held in the fall of 1949. Its development was the focus of a vigorous debate among fewer than 100 people in the U.S. government. Senator Brian McMahon, Chairman of the powerful Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, and General Omar Bradley, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, were among those who supported building a super bomb and believed that we should get ahead as quickly as possible 
Truman also heard from those who opposed its development. Well, the Atomic Energy Commission itself, that is the five Atomic Energy Commissioners, were divided on the subject. The president set up a special subcommittee to study the question. The special committee of the National Security Council consisted of AEC Chairman David Lilienthal, Secretary of Defense Lewis Johnson, and Secretary of State Dean Acheson. That committee met for two months, and at the end of January, I reported to Truman and essentially recommending that he go forward with the development of the hydrogen weapons. That was something that was very much contested and argued about and debated within the administration. Uh, but nevertheless, the committee recommended it, and President Truman, in about seven minutes, approved it. He had no doubt in his mind that it has to be done if it works. The idea that something is too good for us to work on just did not make any sense to him. He never said that, but that is my feeling of him. He also directed his principal advisors on security to produce for him a study as to how U.S. strategy would be affected by this new development. It looked at the larger question of what should we do about our relations and policy toward the Soviet Union. Delivered to the president on April 5, 1950, NSC 68 was a seminal policy document on U.S. national security. Written largely by Paul Nitze, NSC 68 reaffirmed the character of the Soviet threat contained in the earlier NSC 20-4, but now the threat was seen as imminent. In 1954, it was called a year of maximum danger. It assumed that they would have uh, about 200 weapons, and that this would be quite sufficient to do tremendous harm to the United States. Which, in my view, was greatly exaggerated, because, uh, you know, various of Nitsi's estimates then, before that, and after that, about where the Russians were and where they were going to be, were all of them greatly exaggerated. Paul Nitsa was a very skilled uh, infighting bureaucrat in the way that he conducted NSC 68. Uh, he talks about it freely in several of his books. NSC 68 uh, was delivered. Uh, Dean Acheson, uh, as Secretary of State, uh, basically with Nitsa had made the fundamental decision that they didn't want to lay the budget figures out in front of Truman. So NSC 68 was kind of the start of a debate when it gets delivered to the White House in the spring of 1950. But Truman wasn't about to take Nitsa's or Acheson's word for it and set about evaluating the implications as well as the probable cost for the massive nuclear and conventional buildup called for in NSC 68. Within two months, however, this careful and deliberative effort would be cut short by a new military imperative. By the middle of 1950, the North Koreans had a fully trained and equipped army. The Russians had seen to that. The day came when it was revealed what had all along been the communist plan the invasion and seizure of South Korea. The invasion got underway on the morning of Sunday, June 25th, 1950. The invasion of South Korea was a surprise like the Berlin blockade of 1948 and the Soviet atomic test of 1949. Individually, these events prompted the evolution of U.S. strategic nuclear policy. Taken together, they sparked a massive buildup of the nation's nuclear and conventional forces. Many people attach that buildup to NSC 68. I myself have never been sure that there was quite that close a connection. We had a war on our hands. We had uh, tremendous uh, concern and uh, sense of, of danger in Europe. The Korean War hit, and the nature of the decision-making process becomes different almost overnight. And NSC 68, it's one of those peculiarities of history that it happened to be available at the time it did. But it was really the shock of the Korean uh, attack which led Truman immediately to take the lid off of the defense budget. In the United States, there had been great shock that uh, first that uh, war had come about, 
and there was shock in Europe as well because it looked as though the Soviets might be on the march. That's when uh, the European countries uh, decided to ask the United States to send Eisenhower to be the commander. You have the wholehearted backing of the people of the United States, and I know that you'll have that same backing from the 11 other nations who are in the Atlantic Treaty. Goodbye and good luck. In the fall of 1950, intelligence assessments delivered to Truman suggested that a window of vulnerability had now opened. Would the U.S. become more vulnerable while it was increasingly drawn into the Korean conflict and before rearmament could restore the strategic balance? The prospect of a Soviet invasion of Western Europe now deeply concerned Truman and Eisenhower. By winter, the UN forces faced once again the possibility of being driven from Korea. Discouraged, outnumbered, ill-equipped to handle the cold, they barely hung on through the freezing Korean winter. After we had poured basically all the ready forces we had available into the Korean conflict, it was anybody's call as to where Korea was going to go at that point, whether we'd lose the war, whether the Soviet Union would intervene, things of that sort. It was a very desperate situation. There was a good deal talk about uh, trying to uh, estimate what was called the date of maximum danger. Many proposals were in the air that if this is going to happen, uh, it should be headed off. After the Soviets tested in 1949, it was understandable that the United States began to contemplate whether it would be appropriate and indeed necessary for national security to attack Soviet nuclear targets. But Harry Truman rejected the notion that the United States would deliberately precipitate a war against the communist adversary. At the same time, there are a number of military officers who rejected Truman's view. And so people like LeMay and others in the early 50s, when we were way ahead of the Russians in the development of bombs and in the accumulation of them, said, took the view that the war is inevitable and the longer we wait to, before it comes, the worse, we're, the worse off we're going to be. Now, Stuart Symington, who was the chairman of the National Security Resources Board, had previously been the first secretary of the Air Force, delivered a report to the National Security Council. Recommended policies and actions in light of the grave world situation. In the fall of 50 or 51, the calls for preventive war, the, the serious calls that would be get considered at the National Security Council, it was NSC 100 in my estimation. Any further Soviet aggression in areas to be spelled out would result in the atomic bombardment of Soviet Russia itself. Declaratory policy, atomic bombardment automatic. The closest you get to a call for preventive war is this document, in my estimation. And the National Security Council discussion makes it clear that even the principal author of the document, or the principal sponsor of the document, Self was not calling for preventive war. Now, it's a very different question as we get into the Eisenhower years of how you best use the nuclear stockpile of the United States as a psychological tool. As nuclear weapons became more firmly rooted in United States defense policy, their growth in yield would become central to the psychology of deterrence. The natural power of the universe is harnessed in the new atomic bomb. Its tremendous possibilities are explained in this chart. In just a few years after 1949, we had weapons, pure fission weapons, of 50 kilotons instead of 10 to 20 kilotons. They were very fine nuclear weapons. And we didn't have to have a hydrogen bomb, a super, and besides, we didn't know how to make it. Other people felt that we had to have enormously superior power in order to uh, destroy the Soviet Union. The policy, as I understood it, was a clear understanding that our purpose was one of deterrence, that we should be ready with something more powerful. So nuclear weapons made deterrence much stronger. The development of the hydrogen bomb at Los Alamos was part of a much bigger uh, effort 
to expand our entire nuclear weapons program, including the production of materials, the mining of uranium, etc. Uh, in 1950, there were eight sites and 55,000 employees. There were 20 sites three years later and 142,000. And this uh, very dramatic growth continued in the 1950s and the 1960s. Immediately following the detection of the first Soviet atomic test, President Truman authorized successive expansions of the nuclear weapons complex that included plans for a second laboratory in Livermore, California. Meanwhile at Los Alamos, Edward Teller and his colleagues fervently sought a practical design for the hydrogen bomb based upon a fusion reaction within liquid deuterium. There were contributions from a number of people, but the driving force was Teller. I mean, he was relentless and took it up with everyone he could interact with. Stan Ulam came in to see him at Los Alamos. Stan Ulam, mathematician who'd been at Los Alamos for quite a while, and said, you know, Edward, if we compress this liquid deuterium, uh, we can make it work. The reaction rate will be bigger and all that. The idea was that you put a nuclear weapon inside of a container, and for a few moments, the container will contain not only the bomb, but the energy it produces. And that energy can be used for other things, such as perhaps compressing a secondary. Uh, Teller said, well, it won't work, but if you were going to do it, uh, you should use the radiation, because all of the energy comes off in radiation, thermal radiation, and that goes faster, it can be tailored more simply. At that time, I presented a new design in which I had full confidence. We needed the powerful concentrated energy of a primary to make the compression. Once you made it, the secondary worked much better. And that was the whole secret. Now, Teller asked me to devise an experiment to demonstrate that this concept would work. By July 25th, 1951, I had a big sketch of what turned out to be Mike. There were no new ideas, but a very competent write-up as to the actual proposal and how it should manifest itself and be proved in a test. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, or four, three, Mike was tested in November of 1952, just a few months after Livermore was established. So Livermore, of course, had nothing to do with it, although the press often gave us the credit, and we were not allowed to deny it for reasons of secrecy. So the weaponization took place entirely at Los Alamos. The development of an emergency capability based directly on the deliverable version of Mike. Its success seems so assured that it is considered a proof test of one of the emergency capability weapons. Emergency capability weapons were sometimes produced by the Atomic Energy Commission before the concept was tested. Uh, it was so urgent they felt to have these capabilities that if a test was successful, then they would have had the weapons in the stockpile capable of delivering. After Mike, we had the Dirks operation where we went through the development of the Jughead, the Runts, the Shrimp. When Runt worked so well, then that was our first so-called deliverable 20-ton uh, thermonuclear device. When thermonuclear weapons were first developed, what, what it did was gave you more megatons for the buck, so to speak. Before and in the early stages of the thermonuclear weapon, attention was focused on the very large yields, energy releases available. In fact, the impact of the thermonuclear weapon uh, was not that of enormous yield. It was to make it possible to have vastly more weapons with a limited stock of uranium-235 or plutonium-239. In 1950, there were approximately 300 weapons in the stockpile. 
A uh, decade later, there was uh, 22,000. There was a decision to build more coming from Truman. There was a decision to build power. There was the invention of more powerful versions coming out of Mike and the, and the, and the, other, and the things related to Mike. The large growth that we saw in the 1950s and 60s was uh, uh, primarily driven by the capacity of the complex and not truly by requirements. It was our policy at that time not to wait for requirements from the military, but to find out from the technologies then available what the art of the possible would be. Technology offers opportunities, offers possibilities. We didn't understand what the objectives ought to be. Uh, we didn't know what kind of policies or even what plans and programs ought to be laid to achieve those objectives. We face the threat not with dread and confusion, but with confidence and conviction. We hold it to be the first task of statesmanship to develop the strength that will deter the forces of aggression and promote the conditions of peace. My citizens, I thank you. Dwight Eisenhower assumed the presidency in the months following the detonation of the world's first thermonuclear device at an Iwitak. Throughout the campaign, Eisenhower had promised to re-examine the balance between security and solvency. But the initial concern of the new president and his advisors would be resolving the matter of Korea. Shortly after Eisenhower took office and had started the process of developing a fabric of security policies and plans, in the Soviet Union, uh, Generalissimo Stalin died. When he dies, there's an almost immediate um, change of policy in Moscow. Uh, which is discussed with the North Koreans, which says we'll now take a series of steps to try to bring the war to an end. Both sides agreed to a ceasefire in July 1953. By driving the North Korean forces back out of South Korea, the U.S. had produced the status quo ante and an uneasy truce prevailed. Eisenhower and his Secretary of State John Foster Dulles vowed there would be no more Koreas. And both he and Dulles were people who thought you must have a coherent strategy. They decided that they would put a major study of alternative policies toward the Soviet Union for the purpose of hearing a really thought through alternative possibilities. They decided on that in the solarium of the White House mansion. So it took the name solarium as a result of that. And there were really three approaches that were essentially put forward, each assigned to one team. Task Force A was supposed to consider the prospects of a containment policy. B was called drawing the line that if they took any measures to expand, they would run the risk of a massive response. And C was given essentially the assignment of defending a policy of rollback of the idea of trying to force the Soviet Union to capitulate uh, by coercion. At the end of our uh, work, which went on for five weeks, complete in complete secrecy here in Washington, we met in the library of the uh, White House. And each of the teams had a time for a full presentation of, his, of its case. At the end of it, Eisenhower jumped up and said, now I'd like to summarize and comment on what we've heard. And he spoke for 45 minutes without a note, pulling the whole thing together. In doing so, he showed his intellectual ascendancy over every man in the room. Most of the qualities which the press later on uh, simply disregarded. In the end, Eisenhower reaffirmed a policy of containment the president was under no illusions of what a nuclear war with the Soviets would be. It would be a war of utter devastation.
The Joe Four explosion in August of 1953 had a major psychological impact on us. The details were secret. So all the American public and all most of the members of the Congress and other American leaders knew was the Russians had exploded a hydrogen bomb. At the National Security Council, the detonation of a Soviet thermonuclear bomb underscored the urgency of preparing a new national security policy. All of this flows together in the fall of 1953 into a set of decisions which lead to NSC 162-2. He wanted to pay as much attention as possible to how you could take the psychology of nuclear weapons and turn them into making the strategy as deterrent and possible. And also was, was his reading, I think, of the Soviets as a fairly conservative group of decision makers. He didn't think they wanted war either. NSC 162-2 emphasized a nuclear response. In the event of hostilities, the United States will consider nuclear weapons to be as available for use as other munitions, a statement the true intent of which would be debated for decades. The defense strategy had two purposes. One was to deter the Soviet Union. The other was to reassure the NATO allies. And therefore, they required really a higher degree of certainty in order to be reassured than the Soviets did to be deterred. In February 1952, the NATO defense ministers met in Lisbon and agreed to commit 96 divisions in a forward defense of Western Europe. Well, within a year after making that commitment in Lisbon, uh, it became clear that NATO had neither the resources nor the political will to field a force of that size. Eisenhower would use increasing numbers of both strategic and tactical nuclear weapons to deter the Soviets in Western Europe. In November 1953, he directed Admiral Radford, Chairman, Joint Chiefs of Staff, to implement the New Look, a military strategy that placed heavy reliance upon nuclear weapons for the long haul. Eisenhower decided that we were spending too much on the Department of Defense and cut back the planned level of expenditures. This was the new look. Uh, we, in the judgment of the administration, could not stand up against the hordes of Soviet soldiers that would be sent against the West, and therefore uh, nuclear weapons were a substitute for maintaining massive conventional forces. Nuclear weapons got at the heart of NATO strategy very quickly from their initial deployment in 1953. Although the exact role, uh, exactly how and when they were going to be used, was often confusing and ambiguous. NATO intelligence tended to exaggerate the Soviet threat over the years. The prevailing presumption was a worst possible case to wit that the Soviet Union would be bending every resource to build up their military forces against the West as rapidly as possible. And so a lot of our training and, and uh, plans were, were geared on, on, on that, that premise. MC-14-2, massive retaliation or the tripwire strategy, was basically that uh, should this uh, massive invasion occur, uh, massive nuclear forces would be used. It would be all-out nuclear war. It was all or nothing. In the notes of a meeting prepared by Colonel Goodpasture, the president's close personal aide, Eisenhower laid out a deterrent nuclear posture that would set in motion a 20-year buildup of nuclear weapons deployed in Western Europe. Goodpasture wrote, he indicated his firm intention to launch a strategic air force immediately in case of alert of actual attack. He stressed that a major war will be an atomic war. My reading was that if actual attack were made on our forces in Europe or in the United States, uh, the likelihood of escalation to nuclear war was very, very high. And the Soviets knew that. 